delay here. I guess hopefully you don't mind. <laughs> um, uh, let me try to get this one working too. Well, that one doesn't want to work. So we'll go with that one. OK. Um, all right, so last time we talked about flocculation after kind of doing a, a quick overview of sedimentation, why we care about it. We're going to circle back to sedimentation after, after today's lecture and then the next one on um, using precipitation reactions as a way to um, cause coagulation. And so what? Essentially, we're going to do, and let me just see if I can uh, tell this one to. I'm just going to fiddle with this for one second. Let's see if. Anyway, <clears throat> so what I want to do today is talk about particle size distributions and really about how we can detect them. Um, so we've talked a, a fair bit already about some size particles, how big they are. Um, today I want to put some quantitative background in terms of if we do have a bunch of particles in water, A, how do we know what sizes they are, and B, what is that size distribution actually going to look like um, in practice? So a few terms here. The, we can look at particle sizes in terms of a cumulative distribution, and that's what we see here with the, um, these cum cumulative graphs with uh, the cumulative number concentration and of particles as a function of uh, particle diameter or particle volume. And we're going to look at several different um, bases in terms of are we doing a number basis? Are we doing a size basis? Like, what are we, what are we looking at in terms of how big the particles are? OK, so if we take this um, cumulative number, it's, you know, in concept, it's kind of helpful. We can say, OK, well, we have practically none up to this point. No particles are that small. And then at some point we say, oh, okay, well, maybe if we were to integrate the area under this curve, we could say, well, at some point we have some fraction of those are here. Um, or actually, that's, that's the wrong way. Um, we don't need to integrate it because it's already cumulative. We can say, you know, this number whatever number corresponds there, we have that por portion, right? Because that's it's cumulative. That means by this point, by this size, that many, that portion, maybe 20% of the particles or, or in the solution are that big or smaller. So that's kind of the, what we can say about it, um, looking at this particle diameter um, cumulative setup. But it might actually be better if we took the, the differential version so that we can, we can look at it in terms of rather than on this cumulative one, can we draw a plot where we have, um, we can see, okay, well, there's a big spike there. Most of the particles are that size, you know, what we would often think of as a kind of a typical, maybe normal distribution or something like that. Okay, then there's different ways, as I mentioned, this x-axis can change. So this one up here showing diameter, then below that we can transform it to volume, and depending on our, our instrumentation, that, that may end up um, becoming important. So 
So we could describe a system or this, this function here, the particle size um, function as this n of dp. So this is the, the number as a function of it, the diameter. And we can say that's going to be equal to how you know, changes in the concentration per change in diameter. Um, so that's kind of obvious, right? We, we move, in this case, we change our number. That's our, you know, if we're looking at this in terms of plotting a function, right? This is, excuse me, the n, n dp, how that changes. So y equals, it's just going to be how this changes divided by how this changes. So kind of y over, y over x. Um, and so when we, we take a look at this, we could also differentiate that. So that's going to be what gives us that differential form. So we can take dn, d diameter of particle. So if we, if we take it that way, um, we'll see in a moment what, what that can look like for us. We can do the same with the volume. Um, in that case, it would be dn dv. Um, but essentially, this is just that conversion between the cumulative and the differential uh, plots here. So once we do that, we can have some, some plot of our data when we collect, collect data on the particle size distribution. We will plot it, um, and if we were to do, if we were to take the, the log of it, sometimes that ends up be, being kind of useful. Because if we take a look back up here, you know, we didn't even really, I mean, I guess we're dealing with micrometers here. Um, but essentially, if we, if we take this, we often look at it at a log scale because the particles range from nanometer size to micrometer size is, is relevant, and that's three orders of magnitude. So we, we often want to be looking at it in long terms, at least on the, the x-axis anyway. So if we take that number distribution, um, Another way to express just the number would be that dn, or the difference in n, for the difference in log of dp. <clears throat> so if we take this, um, this plot here, for example, this is the log of the, um, that size distribution function per the log of the diameter of the particle. And if we, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what the book was saying, but there's these two slopes we can, we can take and look at, and that gives us some indication of kind of how many particles are there. Um, what's more convenient is if we just don't take the log of this side and just leave it as the number, and then we see, oh, over here, because that, that slope here, I think, is indicating um, this feature. So this is the same data, just transformed differently. Um, and so when we take a look at the, the actual number concentration per log of the uh, diameter, we can get um, this function here. So we can do the same thing with surface area or volume. So if we did surface area, we could say uh, the distribution is the change in the surface area per the change in that log of diameter. We can then transform that and get that as a function of the diameter and compare that to the volume distribution as a function of the diameter. And so what we'll, one thing we'll see here is if we are plotting um, the surface area distribution compared to the volume distribution, they're going to skew based on the diameter effect, right? We're going to have kind of a transformation. Um, based on that change there, every small change in the diameter is going to have a, a bigger change in, um, in the result. So just want to come back for a moment to the, that cumulative versus kind of a, a differential look. If we're plotting some data here, we could see um, on the left we've got 
percent of what percent of the particles are at this volume or you know this particular volume category and kind of have a histogram here overlaid with what this looks like on a cumulative plot right so the cumulative um, this red line here you can see it's it becomes a little less useful after the first little while because the first little while it sort of matches the distribution pretty well and you have some understanding of okay there's this many particles here uh, but then you have to really um, be able to interpret this the pace at which this curve is rising and then flattening off in order to have some useful information to do that transformation so that's why we we would take a look at the the math up there that it I really just am glossing over right now because um, that's not that's not really what I want to focus on it's just kind of background for doing this process um, there there's that direct way to um, relate these these two concepts here and so by taking that mathematical approach then we can take this plot that's not particularly useful but maybe is easier to observe um, with our instruments and convert it to this distribution so we understand what portion of our particles are larger or smaller than a, a given um, diameter. Now, one thing we'll notice is when we talk about the diameter here, a lot of times what we're talking about, you know, maybe we have some particle that's oddly shaped. What's the diameter of that particle, right? That's not exactly clear. So instead, what we're going to look at is um, the diameter of a similar spherical particle that would have the same properties. So if this particle that I just drew here has the same properties as this one, then we're going to treat it as if this is the diameter. Um, so and may maybe that's not very, very well drawn to scale, but um, maybe this is more two-dimensional here and then this is spherical. So the diameter is really um, it's not assumed that the particles directly are spherical, but what we're doing is assuming that a spherical particle can represent the particles there, and then that's the diameter. That's what we call the diameter. So I'm going to say that's the equivalent spherical particle. So here we have two different plots uh, to kind of highlight that difference between surface area and volume as a metric for analysis. Um, plot A here has surface area, um, the surface area distribution on the y-axis, so um, what amount of surface area is, is uh, of the total particle surface area is um, exists because of a particle at this given size. Um, and this is a log plot, so we uh, technically it goes down slightly negative. That just means we're going under one micrometer um, because they're plotting in micrometers. So log of 0.1 is a negative number. So that, that's the reason we have negative numbers here. A lot of times you'll see these plotted on micrometer, but sometimes more often on nanometers if you're working with nanoparticles or something. So that, that would certainly change the, that property here. Okay, so at any rate, some portion of these particles, or of the total amount of particles, we have just a little bit of it's explained here. Um, in fact, if we take a look at the surface area versus the volume, the smallest particles are occupying very little volume, right? almost no volume. But smaller particles have more surface area per particle so we have more signal here and if you were to take if you were to think about it if you were then to consider on a number basis instead of a, a surface area basis or, or excuse me on a um, diameter yeah yeah sorry number basis the number of particles that would give us this amount of surface area would be even larger so as we as we move from 
the volume distribution here that's got, you know, it looks like almost all the particles are one and a half micrometers. This is actually kind of tricky because that's the majority of the volume is occupied by those particular particles. But if we're actually looking at the number of particles, you know, maybe, maybe your analysis needs like a, a catalytic surface. So maybe the surface area is the most important part. So then this volume consideration would be misleading because it, it looks like most of the particles are right here, whereas in actuality, a greater amount of the surface area really could be in this area, and you were making your design based on this area. Um, or, you know, it's shifted at least. Same thing would be true if you're looking at some sort of a numbers interaction, maybe for flocculation, where you are modeling it based on how many numbers are going, or, you know, how many particles are interacting. Then you're going to shift over even further because it takes a lot of particles, a lot of small particles, to contribute this amount of um, surface area. And so, on a numbers basis, it's probably the case that there's only a few, or there's fewer large particles that occupy a lot of volume and a lot of little small particles that are contributing um, to the, you know, very little volume, a bit more surface area, but overall less surface area, less volume than these, than these um, larger ones that just occupy lots of space. Okay, so you could imagine then if we were to plot the numbers basis, it would probably end up looking, you know, a little even more like this, or something like that. Um, so sh again, shifting over, shifting downwards because of that scaling from that cubic to squared um, to just one. Okay, so there's a, an example we'll take a, a look at, see how the book approaches it. Today, I'm not really, I'm not really gunning for you guys to um, be doing the math here, but I thought this would be helpful just to kind of take a look at um, what type of process we could do. Um, and it's a seemed like a relatively straightforward example, so we'll we'll take a look at how the book is um, going through it. And then we'll get into some of the um, particle size measurement techniques and some uh, examples of um, how they're used in, in practice or in research. Okay, so this is example 11-2 in our book. So a particle counter analyzes particles in equal logarithmic increments of diameter with a log diameter equal to 0.1. Okay, so the, excuse me, the, the del delta log diameter. So it's measuring in increments along an x-axis of log diameter of the particle. And this is going to be, you know, each increment that goes by, that is delta write that as delta diameter of the particle equals 0.1. Okay, and then this is in uh, micrometers that we're measuring. <clears throat> so a two milliliter sample is measured in the particle counter <clears throat> and in the size increments bin um, that is centered at log dp equals 0.5 the count is, so we'll say this is 0.5 log of dp. So the bin that's here for like a histogram this measures 1,120 particles. I think this is just particle number on the y-axis here, number concentration. So that would be 1,120 per 2 milliliter, if we were to be correct about the, um, the volume here. Okay, before measurement, the sample is created by diluting the original suspension 1 to 10, 
um, with particle-free dilution water. Find the values of log of delta n per delta dp, as well as just delta n per delta dp. and also delta v, delta log dp. For this value of the diameter, assume particles are spherical. OK, so take a, a moment and try to rationalize what they're, what they're asking for, and then we'll, we'll walk through the, um, the, the book together kind of see, see their approach here. So hopefully that you've been able to kind of take a take a look, see what you think um, about an approach. So the solution that the book provides starts with identifying, okay, what is delta n? Um, and to me, you know, this isn't this is obvious once I see it, but then not so obvious like putting putting the pieces together without kind of uh, the book in front of you here. I can definitely. It was not intuitive to me directly um, like this. So delta n, because um, we're going to need that, right? The, it asked for us to solve for a del log of delta n over delta dp, delta n here, and then probably need that to convert for delta v. Um, so the delta n, really that what we're talking about is the, you know, when we, talk, we, we described one bin, it's how many 
particles changed across that particular size category that we described as a, a bin in our histogram. So that's just going to be the number of particles counted in that bin here um, divided by the volume of sample measured. And uh, I actually kind of noted that when we were talking about um, that 1120 divided by 2 milliliters. Um, so over here, what we can say is delta N is equal to that 1120. It was diluted by a factor of 10, so we have to multiply by 10 here um, to get it back to the original. So times 10, and then divided by 2 milliliters. So if we're on a milliliter basis, that turns out to be, um, just go ahead and get their answer, 5,600 um, per milliliter. So it would be particles per, and they put it in cubic centimeters, which is the same as a milliliter. Okay, so that's um, hopefully that that kind of makes sense. Certainly, is a not too difficult once you once you understand kind of what where they're going with it. So the next next piece would be to take. Um, to look at the log p or log excuse me log diameter of the particle so we're going to we have this in the the log term we know log dp is 0.5 for this bin or centered around that and so we'll use that as kind of this average for these particles um, we know that this is going to this bin is going to be 0.1 um, micrometers Um, or excuse me, this log, that was, I wrote that incorrectly. So the log, and they write delta log dp. So they, with the log there, it's probably unitless actually. Um, so, but on this, on this log plot, each one is like, you know, is that wide. So really this bin starts at 0.45 and ends at 0.55. Um, and that, that's our bin. Okay, so given that, um, we can figure out what diameter we're talking about, and that's what they're doing here. So from log dp equals 0.5, that means dp equals 10 to the 0.5. So that means the diameter of the particle is 3.16 micrometers. Okay, so we've got that part. Um, from the from there we can get the volume because that's going to be um, essentially that number concentration times the volume of one sphere uh, of that size and we've actually we were actually doing that the other day with the flocculation problem where we were saying okay well how many you know what's the flock volume we just need the number of them there multiply that by the volume of one of them that's and then uh, the different the um, delta volume then is equal to that delta n times the, the volume of one uh, sphere there. So they do that calculation um, and solve for the volume there. <coughs> so that gives them uh, that volume term. So we'll do this n times dp cubed times pi over six. So they um, do delta n here. So they, they solve that as well. Um, and what you what we see here is they're just getting these different pieces um, for these for these equations. And um, just as a, a quick reminder, these these forms were essentially the different um, you know, coming from those those other plots that we're looking at, in terms of, uh, you know, can we know what portion of the system is, you know, this size or occupying this amount of volume in our particle distribution? I'm sorry. Okay, so let's come back to what the book is showing. So they solved that. Um, then we have, because the log of dp is given, um, values for um, the volume distribution for the size increment are 
And then essentially they, they put in um, the numbers into the those equations, right? So we're just putting then the numbers that we have just solved, also knowing that the delta log dp is 0.1 is given. Um, essentially they're giving us, they're just solving for the answers here. So the delta n, did I write this wrong? No, okay. So the log of delta n dp Okay, so they're, they're solving that without the log on the upper side for both um, or maybe I just wrote that wrong. Yeah, I just I think I'm trying to understand where they're at here. Okay, so they solve from the delta n here, delta log dp. From there, they go to the volume one, which that was that was answering this portion. So we have okay, so that's where they went from there, and then I think they came back to to solve for up here, looks like, um, and ultimately got that log delta n delta p. Okay, so essentially here we, we have, um, it's, not, it's not always, you know, for me it's not super clear like what, what we were aiming for in terms of how, I, how you explain that in words. I'm sure that we can, we can go back and get it, but the point here was to show we can do these manipulations. They're not overly complicated when we get into it, and that gives us an understanding of what portion of the particles are here. We can translate that across the different um, bases using the, you know, the conversions between, in this case, volume and number, but we could do the same thing with surface area um, to, to solve these problems. And it's, it's really not, um, not something that's super complicated once we actually, if we were to actually um, get a better grasp over specifically what these these terms are and processing them. But again, this is not, was not my intention to have you guys be experts at doing these, these solutions here, but just to give you a feel for um, what's going on, um, especially because you'll probably run into an instrument like this. This is just a random picture from the web, but I could have taken one from my lab because I ended up uh, acquiring um, one of these instruments. This is a photo of a Malvern Zeta sizer. There are other instruments like it, other companies, um, but they they are one of the industry standards, and they have an, a nice little video that I want to share um, to really introduce uh, how we can use what we call dynamic light scattering to observe particle size distribution. So it actually goes through and touches on a lot of what we just talked about. Um, and also helps introduce how we use the same technology or very similar to understand particle charge in solution. Because what we've been talking about with all this coagulation, particle stability, the size and the charge have been very important, but we never really talked about how do we know that size or how do we find that size. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up this YouTube video. And let me see if the audio is going through the room. I need to make sure it does if it's not. I heard that through the room, right? This video will explain the technique of dynamic light scattering, or DLS for short. I'll show you the basics of how DLS works and how you can use it to measure the size of your particles 
and macromolecules. DLS measures the Brownian motion of particles in a dispersion and uses this information to determine their hydrodynamic size. I'll explain this term shortly. Brownian motion is the random movement of particles which results from their collision with solvent molecules, such as water. Smaller particles move or diffuse more quickly and larger particles diffuse more slowly. The rate of Brownian motion is quantified as the translational diffusion coefficient, which is often represented by a capital D. The hydrodynamic size measured by DLS is defined as the size of a sphere that diffuses at the same rate as the particle being measured. This sphere comprises the core particle plus anything which is bound to its surface, for example, any ions or absorbed polymers. So, how do we measure diffusion rates using DLS? Let's take a look. Imagine we illuminate particles with a laser. They'll scatter some of the light that hits them. If these particles were completely still, we'd measure a constant intensity of scattered light. However, in a dispersion, diffusion causes the intensity of light scattered by the particles to fluctuate over time. It's dynamic. The detected light scattered from lots of randomly diffusing particles combines to create a fluctuating intensity signal. The fluctuations are caused by the interference of light scattered by each individual particle. The intensity will change over time as the particles continue to diffuse. The speed of these intensity fluctuations depends on the particle's diffusion rate. The smaller the particle, the more quickly it diffuses, which translates to more rapid fluctuations in scattered light, and vice versa. So, we've explained how Brownian motion affects dispersed particles of different sizes, and we've established how the scattered light will fluctuate over time. Now let's move on to explain how we measure particle size using this information. Simply put, Snapshots of the light scattering signal are taken rapidly, one after another, always comparing these back to the original signal measured. Between consecutive snapshots, which are on the scale of nano or microseconds, the intensity signals are very similar, or well correlated. But when we look at snapshots which are further apart in time, the similarity, or correlation, begins to decrease. Eventually, the intensity signal changes completely and there is no longer any correlation with the original signal. This process is called autocorrelation. The larger the particles being measured, the more slowly they diffuse and the longer it takes for a complete loss of the correlation signal. For small particles which undergo rapid diffusion, the correlation of the signal will decay rapidly. So, how do we use this information to calculate the particle's hydrodynamic size? The autocorrelation function we've created enables us to extract the translational diffusion coefficients, which I mentioned earlier. These values are used in the Stokes-Einstein equation to obtain our size information. Variables such as solvent viscosity and temperature need to be known because they'll affect the particle's diffusion rate. Using DLS, we can quickly measure the size of all the particles in a sample. The size distribution measured is shown in this graph as an intensity distribution. This is the primary result, and it shows the intensity of scattered light from each size population present in the sample. These results can also be converted into a volume or number size distribution if needed. DLS, as used in Mulvan Panalytical's Zeta Sizer range, can measure particle size distributions, ranging from less than a nanometer up to several microns in size. It's a rapid and non-invasive technique which is extremely versatile and used in thousands of applications. For example, DLS is used to help characterize and optimize the pigments used in paints, dyes and inks. To advance research into drug delivery systems such as liposomes and polymersomes, to improve the formulation of emulsions and colloidal systems, to investigate and improve vaccine and drug formulations, and many, many more. 
you can read about how people are using Zeta Sizer systems all over the world for all sorts of applications in Morgan Panalytical's Knowledge Center. This concludes our introduction. All right, so as usual, there's a little bit of an advertisement there for the company, but I, I feel like it's okay for me to share their videos because they're an advertisement, they will probably like that, and it's useful. I, I, I kind of love it when there's some sort of technological um, advertisement like that because it's um, convenient both ways. So that hopefully gives a, a pretty good impression of how it works, and in fact, um, I've used these off and on um, during my PhD and, and after, and even that simple video did a better job explaining the uh, autocorrelation function than when I first learned it. I, I just missed the concept a little bit, but it, it, was, um, it, was very, it was very interesting because that, that correlation function you know, I remember seeing seeing that over and over again, and it like repeats multiple times. And I I never knew um, exactly the uh, the role of that, but it's seeing how long it takes until the correlation falls off. That was very interesting. Um, and uh, you know, you might you might be wondering how accurate are these? And really, the um, the it, it's Pretty, pretty accurate. I would say it depends a little bit on how f how um, precisely dispersed or how precisely sized your particles are. So if you manufacture nanoparticles that are all pretty much exactly 20 nanometers in diameter, have uniform shape, uniform everything, then it's going to give you a very sharp peak. Something you know, if you're look at looking at size in nanometers, and here's 20. Here's 30, here's 10. You're most likely still going to get some kind of normal distribution type shape because um, there are, um, the way the software is going to work, the way the Brownian motion works, you're going to have some rounding of that, but it's going to be a very sharp peak and it's going to be um, quite accurate um, determining that. So you can actually look at different viruses because um, they um, they will exist as particles in solution and you can get a pretty good um, estimation you know if you're to take the coronavirus and take a look under the mic you know under the DLS the, there's smaller than you can see with um, than you can resolve with visible light for like a mic microscopy so you can't image with visible light that way but the particles can still scatter the light so that's why you're able to, like they said, even get potentially below in nanometers. The they'll still be scattering some light, so with the right conditions, um, you can get pretty uh, pretty low ranges in size. Okay, so then uh, there's a few things to keep in mind when you're doing these, and some things that can be quite useful sometimes. You, a lot of these instruments can actually vary the temperature, um, so to cause more Brownian motion as a, as a tool to um, observe what's going on. You tend to need to know the refractive index of um, the particles that you're working with. There are ways to measure this if you have enough of them, but essentially the refractive index is, um, you know, it's kind of like the prism experiment where you have light shining through and then different colors of light travel at different speeds coming back out and I'm probably going to draw this wrong because I don't remember which which way they go um, but just as an illustration here you hopefully get the picture um, you know when when you do that the each wavelength has a um, the, the material here has a, a refractive index that is unique to each wavelength. And so it's going, the refractive index is essentially um, a measurement of how much slower the light is passing through that material. So if you look into a um, very uh, calm and clear swimming pool, for example, you'll see the bottom, but what you're not actually seeing a direct line from your vision, you're seeing a refraction 
kind of down downward at an angle, um, and that has to do with that that different speed that it's it's going through, and it um, does that refraction based on the angle that it hits. So that that's needed for the uh, software to to better pre better um, assign its values based on how they should how the the light should be scattering there. So that that process right there is understanding that and having an accurate value for your particles um, is obviously um, one one component where you might have uh, complicating factors at play. There's also a potential difficulty if your if your system does have lots of different sizes particles. So you have a mixture of what we'd call a poly polydisperse um, solution, where you have some particles that are that size and then some over others that are kind of this size and then another peak over here. We would ca call that a polydisperse um, distribution. So there's multiple peaks or just simply particles kind of all over the place. Um, the software doesn't do a good job dis Distinguishing between those um, where can have can have trouble. Technically, you can resolve them to an extent, but again, if they have different refractive indexes, you give the instrument one, and it's working with that one. Um, so, if you get a complex system, it can can be too challenging to have really meaningful results from there. But if you're working with something like a particular nanoparticle you're trying to characterize, or uh, like the the video mentioned maybe um, colloids in paints, and you're just trying to do quality control. These are often used for quality control in that manner. You're doing the same thing over and over again. You know what to expect. You know what's there. And if you get a reading that's too large, too small, or whatever, um, then you throw that batch out or something or have to um, revise or whatever the case. Can be can still be very useful in a lot of, a lot of cases. OK, um, and then. Given, given that whole correlation system, so the, the last thing I want to say here is that autocorrelation, you know, we're taking very messy signals and then running these correlation programs and then averaging to see, see um, okay, how do the correlations fall off um, and get some sort of average autocorrelation signal. Even with the repeated trials, um, we're going from this intensity signal uh, that's interpreted based on this autocorrelation um, feature or um, strategy and then we're getting some intensity number um, that we relate to the size so at this we, we expect that this many of them are at that size so there's a lot of algorithms a lot of com computational stuff at play here and not a lot, not nearly as direct of signal, um, signal to answer ratio that we're used to in some other measurement techniques. So if you use an HPLC, for example, maybe you're doing the mass detector or a UV detector and it, measuring s exactly the electrons kicking, kicking out or have exactly to do with the amount of light absorbed or um, something impacting the detector. So in this case, there's a lot more steps in between. So I say that. Um, to kind of add a caveat to these measurements just to say that um, it's messier. We, we can't rely on it to the same level of precision um, that we might other, other techniques. Um, it's not to say it's not useful. Um, here's an example from my past research. We had different nanoparticles forming and this, these were um, a number count as percent versus a log plot of the size in nanometers, and it turns out that there was a couple materials that were less stable. So um, we talked about this a little bit, but the particles over here, um, these all had zeta potentials, which we'll talk about in a moment, of about negative 50 millivolts or something like that. Um, so these guys did, as well as these ones. Those all happen to have a pretty negative. Now these ones here were positively charged, and 
in fact, these were um, fullerene, uh, fullerene aggregates in water. So these ended up forming the negative charge, these as well. These guys had um, something about, something like plus 10 millivolts. These ones maybe plus 20 to 30. And, oh no, sorry, wrong one. Um, this guy was actually negative, just slightly negative. So it was not very stable and um, was not able to repeat that observation because they would uh, sediment out and aggregate together. Um, so this one was about plus 20 and this one was more like plus 30. And then this one was negative 50 or something. So when we were adding negative charges or positive charges to these aggregates that would have otherwise been negative, we saw something very interesting and it was a good example of how you're destabilizing particles. In practice, I did get this one um, distribution here, but it was not repeatable um, because it was not stable. So I'd have to like sonicate it, prepare fresh and measure it right then and then I could get something out of it. Um, Okay, so just here's an, one last uh, depiction of that number versus surface area versus volume with all three on here. So I mentioned earlier to kind of imagine what that number would look like. Um, just kind of coming back to that. And you see the way they're, and this is from a different um, uh, book or website or something, but there's they're also using this differential of volume per, in this case, natural log of um, diameter or the surface area or the, the number. And we see um, the number of particles, it takes very few particles that are large to, to m create that much volume. All right, just a few particles that are very big are gonna occupy a, a whole lot of volume. Whereas you have lots and lots of smaller particles. And so that's, that's another um, challenge when dealing with these um, computations is because what you observe um, is kind of an, in, an intensity measurement and you have to make sure you're correctly interpreting that into okay, what volume of the water is occupied by particles and then you, every iteration can multiply an error if there was an error, right? So as you go, it, it's, um, it kind of highlights the importance of the accuracy or in some cases lack thereof of, of the, the measurements. Okay, so very useful, not, not always incredibly accurate, but it does have potential to be quite accurate. That's kind of what the, the end of the day, what I would say. So in terms of zeta potential, how we measure that is actually pretty much the same as measuring the, the dynamic light scattering, except here we can add an electrical field and see what happens. So we can alternate the electrical field back and forth and induce, instead of Brownian motion, cause the particles to move and track that. And so we can use the same uh, features of the dynamic light scattering, the same technologies, but having this with a, you know, a positive field here and a negative field here so to make them go in a direction and then potentially reverse that um, watching the particles go back and forth. The, the pace at which they accelerate through the water um, is gonna be indicative of their size. Um, there's a, few, a couple ways to do it. Um, one is a, a reusable dip cell that, um, <clears throat> so you, you essentially just dip a cuvette into, or uh, dip a special cell into a cuvette, so we'll say, this that has two plates and so this this cell thing is attached you know is attached to the electronics or actually really the electronics have a, some sort of a attachment here sends sends the electrical signal through and the particles are are going back and forth through here and measured by the the laser that's going through that slot as well so that's, that's one way, and then they also make disposable ones where you have kind of a, uh, a capillary cell where 
you just have a, a positive charge on one side and then you just let it flow through, let the particles flow through and you're just watching them flow through as, as it goes. Um, so if you ever use one of these, it'll be one or the other um, types there. Um, so dip cell or capillary. Essentially they're doing the, the same thing, slightly different method. We'll just draw it like that. Um, really using that electrical field as the driver for the, the motion. And if you already have some information about the size, which the computer, or the system can, can collect right there on the spot, then you can know something about their charge, given how fast they're going. Okay, and now, as the video mentioned, an important thing to consider here is the, um, that what we're measuring here, in terms of both the, the size, is actually the hydrodynamic radius. It's not the, it's not the particle itself, it's the particle plus anything that's stuck to it, and the, essentially that electrical double layer that we talked about, um, and it, I think that if you want to be very particular, you can call that first layer of ions the stern layer, and then past that, I guess the, the next layer of mostly negative ones is the, the double layer or the slipping, gets out to the, the slipping plane or something. But the, the particle itself has a charge, and what we're measuring, we're measuring that indirectly. So the, the particle charge itself we're not observing because we're observing the kind of the ions that are stuck around it. And so that's technically what we're observing. It's technically different than the charge of the particle itself. So if you were to get into this kind of field and get into the nitty gritty, then it's important to distinguish between the particle um, surface charge itself and the zeta potential because they're not truly the same. There's different factors that can affect them um, and their measurements. One thing that you can take a look at, given different uh, zeta potentials, is how stable are the particles. So anything that's close to zero is not very stable. If you have no charge at all, you're pretty much destabilized. You'll have rapid coagulation, flocculation. Anything between, you know, and it, it is plus or minus here. It's, um, essentially the absolute value. If you're between 10 and 30, um, you're fairly unstable and it will probably be aggregating. Um, 30 to 40 is, you know, as I say, moderate. Then you get up to good or excellent stability as you go higher. Um, and so just as a reference, thinking back about the, the ones I mentioned, I had one that was varying between plus and minus 10 in that range of observations. That one was obviously not very stable. Had one that was about 20, kind of plus 20 or so, and that was stable enough. Um, and then I had one that was about plus 30, it was definitely stable. And then the negative ones were all somewhere between negative 40 and negative 60 when I would measure them. And so those, those were certainly stable, um, even in the long term. Okay, so there's one last measurement technology that um, I have not used myself, but is fairly interesting. Um, and I think there's just like one minute of a YouTube video here. Um, this is called uh, differential cent centrifugal sedimentation. So instead of using light uh, scattering, you can actually cause particles to sediment if you are able to induce a G-force uh, increase the g-force, right? So instead of using the gravitational pull of the Earth, which can only pull particles so so uh, small, well, try try Jupiter, right? Try spinning this with a centripetal centripetal force um, to cause the sedimentation, and then you're essentially measuring with a a light, maybe a laser, just to see whether or not particles have passed um, passed through that spot and sedimented to the bottom. You can monitor that based on how, how much acceleration you're providing. You can then get a, actually a very accurate estimate of uh, the particle sizes. Um, 
in that method. Okay. And sample type. DCS can be used to analyze particle size distribution. The technique utilizes a modified version of Stokes' law to determine an unknown distribution of particle sizes by measuring the time it takes for the particle to settle from a known distance in a liquid of known viscosity and density. Exposure to high g-force through a centrifuge allows the sedimentation of even very small particles, down to just a few nanometers in size, to occur quickly, enabling real-time analysis. The CPS disk centrifuge allows the measurement of highly polydispersed particles within an approximate size range of 3 nanometers to 60 microns, depending on particle density. The CPS can measure particles with as little as 2% size difference from one another. Rather than rely on a predictive algorithm, the CPS physically separates particles and measures them as they pass a light source detector. Key benefits of the CPS disk centrifuge include 2 to 10 times higher resolution than any other particle sizing instrument, the ability to measure low density, neutral buoyancy particles, highly reproducible results, its ability to detect and measure tiny, subtle differences in particle size. It can measure and monitor nanoparticle coating thickness, and it can also be used to calculate particle density if the size is known. The CPS disk centrifuge has applications in a wide variety of sectors, varying from the analysis of virus and virus-like particles to gold and silver nanoparticles used in drug delivery systems, to liposomes, carbon nanotubes, polymeric particles, water and oil-based pigments, and printing ink. Further information on any of our particle characterization solutions. Okay, so that's that. Um, again, another advertisement there. I think it's, um, you can kind of tell they're, they're taking jabs at the dynamic light scattering industry. Like, we're better in these ways. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's kind of, kind of funny that that happens. Uh, interesting technology. Um, there's a couple caveats there. I think you need to know a little bit more about the particles in terms of their density or um, instead of the refractive index, I think some information about the density is important. So it has its own challenges, but um, in some ways it's always a good thing to have direct measurement um, when possible. So uh, that'll, that'll be it for today. Um, so uh, I will post a homework assignment soon um, before next class is my, is my aim. It'll probably be a list of problems from, from the textbook um, and and that'll start getting our minds kind of geared towards what we're gonna um, have our first exam on. So I'll I'll send an announcement when I do that. So I'll see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>